Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Malachi's Message Toxic Mold Sex Podcast and Video Podcast. I'm Elizabeth Kripe. I'm Malachi's Message Executive Director and co founder. Co hosting today is Emily Rochelle. She is our co founder and our board chair. Today we have the privilege of having a very special guest with us. Dr. Grunning is joining us. Dr. Grunning is a Christian physician and seeks to heal the whole person, body, mind, and spirit, because that is what provides the greatest long-term success for patients. He's the author of Prescription for Health, a comprehensive guide to living a balanced life in a toxic world, and was the host of his own TV program of the same name, still visible on his YouTube channel. He is the founder, executive, and medical director of the Southwest Florida Free Pain Clinic. The only free medical clinic in the U.S. specializing in the comprehensive treatment of low-income, uninsured patients with acute and chronic pain. Dr. Grunning speaks frequently about numerous topics to many different groups around Southwest Florida and at national conferences. Dr. Grunning, thank you for joining us today. You're welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. For, yeah. So thank you for reaching out to us as well. Um, I did not know about your clinic, and it is incredible. One of our funds as medical assistance because we see so many people go through mold and CIRS and CFS and they mm-hmm. can't afford the treatment and they really want to get well. So when we came across your organization and what you do, it was an automatic intrigue to say the least. So we are just grateful that you're here to talk more about your organization, but really more about too, how you've seen mold impact people. Sure. I'd be glad to do that. Um, yeah, I actually gave a talk um, at our national conference, um, you know, for Surviving Mold, the Shoemaker Group, um, back in, I don't know, a few months ago. And the title of the talk was "Sirs on a Budget. Um, you know, how do you take care of people that have this horrible illness and don't have any money and don't have any resources and don't have any insurance? And, and are there ways to successfully do that? And that's what I've been doing for, you know, a long time, seven years now. Um, so I've gotten pretty good experience on how not to cut corners, so to speak, but how to modify the protocol so that it's still successful, but it fits within the confines of the budget of most people. That's, that's amazing because the biggest hurdle for everybody that goes through mold is they lack the finances needed to recover, you know, recover everything that they lost, um, go see the doctors that they need to see, which generally don't take their health insurance. So everything's out of pocket. Can you tell us a little bit, like what made you want to start this clinic? Was it because you saw so many people that couldn't get any help because they couldn't afford it? So um, I was my, by nature, my practice was in emergency medicine. That's what I did for 17 years. And I ran ERs and I was very much involved in a traditional medical system. And in 2001, I left all of that to open up my own practice. And little did I know in the course of that, that I would get sick and develop chronic fatigue syndrome. And I couldn't find, this was back in 2004, and I couldn't find anybody, my colleagues, who could tell me what was wrong with me, what to fix me. They all told me I was overworked, I was stressed, I was depressed, I was whatever, and there was nothing really wrong with me. And so I had to go out and learn on my own. Um, And so that was when functional medicine was really in its infancy. And so I had to go to a lot of conferences and read books and study on my own to kind of learn how to manage me. Um, And and then eventually my patients. And then um, I started to figure out how to take care of fibromyalgia patients. And they started coming from everywhere. Um, And so my practice shifted into more of um, focusing on taking care of biotoxin patients. And so that's what I've been doing really for 17 years now. And along the way, I had a free medical clinic um, in the past um, that was a primary care clinic. And I had had to shut that down in 2008 because of multiple reasons and the economy and different things. So I was kind of itching maybe to get back into that. And I'll spare the entire story, but Um, On August 13, 2010, um, I met with the Lord and he told me to start a free pain clinic. This is not something I dreamed up. It would be never something anyone would dream up. No one had ever done this before. Um, And I heard very specifically what I was supposed to do, who I was supposed to call, how this was supposed to happen. And I did all that. And within two months, we launched the Southwest Florida Free Pain Clinic. 
Um, it's the only clinic of its kind in the United States. No one's ever done this before um, to take care of people with no insurance and no money and um, no resources who are in pain from various things and to get them better naturally without the use of any drugs, without any of that, and to get people off of opioids and all these horrible things. Well, along the way, I began to see that a lot of these patients had SIRS. And I was like, okay, is there a way that we can take care of these patients in a free medical clinic? Is there some way that we can, because I couldn't get the lab work, you know, the, all the HLA testing and all the stuff that you guys talk about, couldn't get any of that. So I was like, is there some way to safely do that without all those things? And, and I discovered there was. And, and so that became the basis of this whole talk that I gave on SIRS on a budget and how we've been able to modify Richie's protocol uh, over time to be able to account for people who don't have the resources. So my average patient um, that comes to my regular practice, as you can imagine, has seen 15 other doctors before they ever come to me. Um, many of them have spent 50 to $100,000 on their own medical care for needless treatments that are not helping them. Uh, I mean, I hear horror stories from people every week uh, on going to clinics where there's, you know, getting IV infusions of this, that, or the other thing, and chelation and ozone and all these various things that are not fixing them. Um, so I, my goal is to get people off of all that needless stuff and testing and treatments and focus them on the things that really work. And so my free clinic, we can do that. Now, these people don't have the money for supplements. They don't have the money for well call. They don't have the money for anything. So I have to give them all of that for free. And fortunately, we have the ability um, to be able to do that. Um, how do you fund this? Because that has to be very expensive. Does your other practice kind of fund the free clinic? No, we actually have a 501c3. And so we're you know out raising funds and applying for grants and doing all the same stuff you guys are probably doing. Um, but we're not getting we're not getting the big money that we need to be able to run this. So I'm actually within the last week have have decided that we're going to have to totally change directions of what we're doing. And we're going to become a mobile clinic and we're going to go out to communities that have been affected by Hurricane Ian and be able to take care of the biotoxin patients on site. Uh, in their communities, instead of having them come to us, which has been problematic because they don't have the money for transportation, they don't have gas, they don't have whatever, um, we're going to go out and, and decentralize and, and start working out of remote locations and take care of people that way. Um, but yeah, so we're raising funds and, and donations and all that to be able to supply uh, these things to people. Now, in the past, I had gotten um, actually a large donation to WellCall. Um, from a company called AmeriCares, which um, supplies medications and things to missionary groups around the world and takes care of free and charitable clinics here in the United States. And so I'd gotten some well call from them and stocked up on it, but there hasn't been any more. And eventually I'm going to run out. And so um, I'm trying to find other sources for that. And then there's a supplement company named Swanson who's been very generous and they've donated a whole bunch of supplements to me. Um, that I can give to the patients for free. Some we have to buy, but a lot of it's been donated. So the, the long answer to your question was, yes, we have to find the funds to, to do all of what we do. I, I didn't know that you personally went through your own illness and journey. Was that because of mold? Yes. So I'm a 4353. If you know anything about the genetic types, I'm you know the second worst you can have. And um, so, yeah, I didn't realize that I was being made sick by my environments. Um, you know, I knew I had chronic fatigue. I knew I had Hashimoto's. I knew I had all those things, but the cause of all that was the SERS. And I can trace it back to, you know, multiple exposures I've had over the years. Um, as with all of your people that are listening, this isn't just a one-time event. You've had this your whole life and you've had hit after hit after hit after hit of water damaged buildings and eventually you fall off a cliff that's what happened to me and uh, i know exactly how it happened um, we were going to open a second office in fort myers i was in port charlotte florida which is a little north of here and and so i decided okay we're going to offer off uh, open a second office well we sound, found this lease space that was very affordable and we walked in there and it hadn't been used for two years 
and there was black stuff growing on the walls. And so we're like, oh, that's mold. Um, we can fix that. So we got some bleach and we bleached the walls. And that's where me and my family all started getting sick. I mean, because as you know now, that's the worst thing you can do. Um, so we should have left that place, but we didn't know enough at the time to leave that place. That was in 2004 uh, or 2001, actually. Um, so before we knew a lot of what we know now, now I would have walked out of that place like the moment I walked in. But uh, that's where kind of a lot of it began. So in medical school, were you ever taught about mold illness or how dangerous mold is? Now, you're going back a little ways there, my friend. Um, so <laughs> I was in medical school uh, back in 1979 to 83. And the answer is no, um, th that was never mentioned. And I will also tell you, because this comes up all the time, too, like so a lot of my patients have autoimmune diseases. Um, there's an epidemic of autoimmune disease, right? So back in 1981 or so, I remember sitting in a lecture in medical school and this guy got up, he was a rheumatologist and he talked about autoimmune disorders, specifically lupus. And he said, you guys will never see this in your career. I remember very clearly he said that to us. You will never see this. Maybe a rheumatologist might see this once in a while, but you will never see it. Now, everybody has an autoimmune disease, it seems like. What happened? What went wrong here? You know? Well, I can tell you what happened. We poisoned our environment. That's what happened. And so now we're reaping the consequences of that. But in regards to autoimmune diseases, I haven't found one yet that didn't have SIRS. Oh, wow. How do you, found one? Why do you think that SIRS is becoming more prevalent these days? Well, I think there's numerous reasons. Um, you know, our buildings, first of all, we're building more and more and more buildings, and the buildings are getting older and older and older. And they're just not water, you know, they're not resistant to water damage. And then we're having more and more natural disasters like Hurricane Ian that are coming through and destroying roofs and flooding homes. And so, no, this is just, this is multiplying. It's multiplying exponentially. And it's not just our homes, right? Like, I'll share with you that in our community, we have four hospitals and two of those are contaminated because uh, I take care of nurses that are in them. Um, multiple businesses, government buildings, schools. I mean, I'm regularly pulling kids out of schools because the schools are making them sick and nobody cares and no one wants to listen to what we have to say. And so it's a huge problem and it's growing logarithmically. Schools are a big issue. I personally got an email back from one district because I was trying to get the, the reports on the schools and to see if they've ever had an inspection done. And um, they flat out said no, that they've not done any mold inspections on any of their schools because it's not, they don't have to. There's no law that states that they have to regularly check them. And, and we find that schools are a big issue for They're children. They're a huge issue. Um, schools are very poorly maintained. The air conditioning systems are all contaminated. No one services them properly. There's leaks. I mean, I have teachers telling me that they're catching water in buckets in their classroom. I mean, that's absurd, right? So, and these are people that, you know, have sickness. And so, and then you start to think about all the kids that are in the schools that have, quote, ADHD or some behavioral issue, right? How many of those kids are there are because of the school, their home? Um, you know, how many of them who have a brain on fire, literally their brains on fire, and people are putting them on Ritalin because they calms them down? Why don't they check the source of anyway? It's very disgusting. No, I'm I'm with you there. You know, if they if they're going to school and that school has mold in it, and these days, you know, they're encouraging more chemicals because of, you know cleaning methods to not spread anything, germs and so forth, those chemicals just make the mold want to go into sporulation that much more. So Correct. It makes yeah. And I don't know how much, you know, you've discussed on your, um, your shows here about, you know, what's really going on in water damage buildings and about actinomycetes and gram negative bacteria. I mean, it's not just molds, right? I mean, the molds are probably for those of us who do a lot of this, it's probably 10 to 20% of the problem we're dealing with. The bigger problem is bacteria. Uh, and that's what 
Richie Shoemaker takes a lot of heat over is for coming out and saying that and the mold community doesn't like it, but that's the reality. As I check, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of reports from Envirobiomics on my patients' homes, I will tell you that actinomycetes is the big player that I'm dealing with, with all of my patients. It causes horrible brain damage, brain atrophy, um, and no one is addressing that. None of the people driving around town that say mold remediator are addressing any of that. Um, so they're missing 80% of the problems that are causing our patients to be sick. So when somebody comes to your clinic and they're suffering, do you have a certain tests that you automatically do for them to kind of see how they're being affected or, be, or what they're being affected by? So you're talking about my free clinic, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So we have some very good screening tests available for SIRS, right? Like the visual contrast test, the VCS test is extremely accurate if you fail it. Um, it's 98.6% accurate if you fail it and you did it correctly. Now, again, 8% of people can pass that and still have SIRS, but I can usually tell because of their symptoms. So, so VCS testing is a great screening tool. And then I use a symptom questionnaire uh, that, you know, has this, I don't know if you've talked about the symptom clusters and this and how to determine from symptoms whether patients are better or not or have SIRS or not. It's extremely accurate. It's been prospectively studied and published uh, by our group. Um, so if you have you know eight out of the 13 symptom clusters on this sheet positive, you have a 98% chance of having biotoxin on this. So if you fail your VCS test and you have the symptoms, you don't even need the lab test. The lab tests help you to confirm what you're thinking but you already know. So that's how I screen our free clinic patients is VCS testing and symptom cluster analysis. Um, and then I do have available from our local health system, some free lab work that I can do with people. It's kind of basic stuff like a CBC and a CMP and a vitamin D level, which is important and maybe their thyroid function, which is important. So I can get a few free things on them but like not the good SIRS tests that we will or like. So, but I know enough from their screening tests that this is what's wrong with them. So for people listening that are hearing this and going, okay, I'm, what are the main symptoms that you see oftentimes show up in patients that are coming to your free clinic? So it's the same as I see in my regular practice. I mean, um, you know, the predominant symptom that people have with this is fatigue. Um, and that's caused from, you know, the, the poisoning of our cellular production of proteins. And that's a whole long, another conversation we could have um, through, through the biotoxins and through cytokines. And so the result of that is the cell shifts into this state of hypometabolism or slow metabolism and poor energy production. So you've heard about mitochondrial dysfunction. Well, this is the cause of the mitochondrial dysfunction. And so you're not making energy anymore. And so the result of that is fatigue. And that's like the number one symptom that people have. And then the second most common problem is the brain fog, right? And so the reason that people have brain fog is because these biotoxins and especially the cytokines that we're making in response to that are crossing the blood brain barrier and destroying the brain. Uh, literally your brain is on fire. That's the way I describe it to people. It's horribly inflamed. And the result of that are areas of brain atrophy or deterioration. And so I see that routinely on people. So that's what's causing a lot of the brain fog and neurocognitive symptoms that people are having with this. So 35% of the symptoms are neurocognitive. It's either, I can't remember stuff like short-term memory, can't find the words to get out, can't focus, can't concentrate, which then is misinterpreted as ADD or ADHD. Um, depression, anxiety. I have bipolar patients with this and they get better too. Um, so there's a whole host and then strange neurological symptoms, uh, tics and uh, neuropathic pain that no one can diagnose and figure out why they have this, pseudo seizures. I have all of that. And all that goes away when you fix their SIRS. So fatigue, neurological symptoms, those are probably the two most common things. Then GI problems, leaky gut related issues, um, headaches, um, 
And then, you know, the worst of all are the people that have mast cell activation problems. If you've talked about that before, multiple chemical sensitivity syndrome, those are kind of the worst people I deal with. Um, and probably those are 10 to 20% of my practice are people that have those extreme problems and, um, and a very difficult to treat. Most practices have given up on them. Uh, I know what to do with them, so I, I don't give up on them. Um, but yeah, so those are like the predominant things that people have. Whenever you discover that it's mold that's causing mold bacteria that's causing their symptoms and that's coming from their home, do you ask them to leave their home or like if, what do you do in that situation? Well, that all depends, right? Like Right now, after Hurricane Ian, I can't ask them to leave their home because they have nowhere to go. There's no hotels. There's no places that haven't been damaged. There's no homes for sale. I have actually people living in RVs right now. That's actually been the best option I could find was encouraging people to buy an RV or rent an RV. And we clean that out. And then they stay there for a while because there is no other place to go. So now think about, though, if you're also in the free clinic environment and you're living in a rental apartment and the landlord does not care and you have nowhere really to go from there because the next place you go to could be just as bad yeah. so basically i'm left with you know trying to get the landlord to inspect the air conditioning system and clean it out and teaching the people how to decontaminate their structure which is a lot of what i do oh wow you you help them understand how they can de decontaminate their own environment? Unfortunately, as a doctor, and I didn't know any of this, so I've had to learn. Um, you can't take care of SERS patients without getting intimately involved with environments. Uh, it's, it's the step one, right? Remove yourself from the exposure. I mean, you have to get involved with this. And I can't rely on the remediation industry to do it correctly because they don't. So I have to work on this myself. So I partner with a local air conditioning company that I personally trained their technicians what to do, what to look for, how to fix the air conditioning systems in my patients' homes. So I've got them on, on one side. Um, I've got an indoor environmental inspector that I use. He's awesome. He'll go into some of my free patients for nothing and, and just look at their place. Um, and then I have a decontamination protocol that I've worked out with um, multiple people, and I share that with patients and educate them about how to get their place decontaminated. Uh, somebody's got to do it. You can't rely on anybody else to do it, so I teach them how to do it. That's incredible. That's incredible, because you're actually... Yeah. And the tools that they can use down the road too, not just in this one location. Yeah, because this is Again, right. So once you do that. the initial decontamination, there's an ongoing process yeah. to maintain it, right? And otherwise yeah. it'll creep back in again. Like actinomycetes are being shed by us, right? So so the thing is it's always going to reaccumulate. You have to constantly be vigilant to keep it under control. But it's doable. I do it. If I do it, other people can do it. You know, so <laughs> I just have to teach them what to do and and give them the tools to do it. Now, unfortunately, things like a HEPA vacuum, my free clinic patients can't afford $800 for that. So I purchased a couple through our free clinic and we loaned them out to the patients to help do the decontamination of their home, which has worked out pretty well. Um, yeah, so there's steps to this that are expensive, but you know what, I'd rather people invest in that than in needless supplements and ozone treatments and other things that are not helping them at all. Is your protocol for decontamination, is that public knowledge where people can go find it or do they have to be your patients? Yeah, I, I kind of keep that closely guarded. Uh, yeah, it's not, but the, so. the principles though are not, I mean, it's not that hard. I mean, you can go on um, the surviving mold site and look at the consensus statement for the IEPs, and they cover all of this. It's just done in 100 pages where I've condensed it down to two. Um, but, but, you know, a lot of it just has to do with fine particle cleaning of the environment. And, mm -hmm. and if, you can, if you can do all that and understand how to do all that, um, then it's, you can get your place clean. But this is assuming, though, that there's no ongoing areas of water damage. Like if you have a leak behind a wall 
and you're not seeing it and it's full of gunk, this isn't going to fix that. Yeah, you have to definitely find that water source and fix that. Otherwise, it's just going to come back and continue to occur. But I'll um, tell you that down here in Southwest Florida, and I don't know how that true, you know, how true it is in your area, but down here, 75% of my problems are from the air conditioning system. Um, once that gets contaminated, the whole place is contaminated. So if I can get that fixed, I usually have fixed the major part of the problem that they're dealing with. And, you know, so that's something that's super important wherever you're, you know, people watching this are living, you know, you have to have a reliable air conditioning company, an HVAC company come in and look inside the air handler, which is the big aluminum box that sits either in your attic or your garage, which is horrible. It should be in a closet inside your house. Um, but to look in there, look at the cooling coils, look at the fan, look at the plenums and see if there's anything visible growing on there. Well, if you talk to any good AC people, they know immediately, oh, that's mold growing on that. They know it. And so they has to be decontaminated. They have, that whole thing has to be cleaned out, thoroughly cleaned out. And once you do that, then the source now is gone, but you have to decontaminate the structure. Um, because whatever was in there is all over the place now, and it all has to be fine particle cleaned. So over here in Texas, the AC is typically a huge culprit in regards to- I have you know, patients in Texas, yes. So I know. <laughs> I mean, um, it's, a huge, it's a huge problem. But, you know, in situations where there's multiple sources of mold and people can't afford to remediate all those areas at once, which is the truth for most people, you know, because it comes directly out of their pocket because home insurance generally isn't going to help them fix it. You know, fixing the AC system first usually helps the most because those are the lungs of the home, you Correct. know, and then as they can't afford to remediate those other areas, they do. Because a lot of people, especially right now, and the way the economy is in the market, they can't afford to sell their home and then go buy a home that's going to be more expensive for them or go get an apartment now where the rent's higher than their current mortgage when they bought their home 10 years ago. So the um, apartment's probably contaminated anyway. Yeah. So a lot of a lot of people have to, you know, learn how to contain off the areas in their home that have the mold situation, the mold growth and clean the rest of their house that they can live in and fix the AC at least in order to help bring that contamination down. Those are kind of the basic steps um, that I try to get through to people is let's have somebody come in and look at the air conditioning, try to clean that out if there's a problem. Of course, the air conditioning companies want to sell them a new system. That's kind of what they all do. Um, you know, so I tell them, you know, hey, if your system's 15, 20 years old, you probably should do that. If it's not, don't don't listen to all that and then they want to sell them uv lights you know that's the other big thing they want to put in there a couple thousand dollars for that yeah. i'm like if your system is balanced properly you don't need uv lights um, thank you for saying that that yes. happens all the time <laughs> yes we, we have photographs of mold growing on the uv light because they didn't fix the source like if the right. there's no source of moisture it's not going to have a mold problem so you don't need a uv light if so I had to learn air conditioning from when I first got into this. I learned from a guy in town here who had been doing it for 40 years, uh, Mike, great guy. And I didn't know anything about air conditioning. He sat down with me one day and spent hours with me telling me all the ways that air conditioning systems can go wrong. And I didn't know any of this. It's amazing any of them work properly. Um, what he did is he told me that the average air conditioning person driving around town is a knucklehead. That's what he told me. He said they don't know anything. And all they know how to do is come in and put some Freon in and change a filter and that's it. Um, so you have to really insist upon making sure that the work is done properly. And so somebody has to come in who knows what they're doing and look inside the air handler and see what's going on and decontaminate it. But then the pressures have to be adjusted properly. Otherwise, the system runs too cold and it, and it develops um, water inside the air handler. And that's how things start to grow. The UV lights don't fix that. Um, mm -hmm. Then they want to sell them a Remy Halo. That's the other big thing now. Remy Halos don't fix that. Uh, in fact, a lot of my patients react to Hemi halos and, and Remy halos, and they get sick from them. So I think that, you know, we, sometimes you have to just come back to basic things. You get the air conditioning fixed. You make sure that there's not any ongoing water damage in the house. 
So how do you do that? Well, that's where an environmental inspector can be really helpful who has a thermal camera. So if they can come in and do thermal imaging inside the house, they can see if there's any ongoing areas of water damage, and, and then you can figure out, okay, I need to correct that. But if all that is done and it's not, then you just have to decontaminate the home because these things can be left over from previous owners, uh, years ago leaks, um, whatever. Um, and then actinomycetes is a whole nother discussion that we're shedding that all day long. And so you can decontaminate the house and then usually it's good. The other thing that people ask me though a lot about is air filters. And if you wanna get into that discussion, we can do that. Well, you know, you mentioned about how the AC technicians, whenever they come out, that, you know, when they look around inside that they, they, you know, if they see mold, they're going to mention mold. Well, I find that most of the ones that we deal with that or our clients have dealt with, they never tell them that they do see mold. They call it dust or they call it, you know, dirt or organic growth. We have a very good friend, Christina, who, you know, they thought they were doing everything right every single year. They would have somebody come out and they look in their AC system and their ducts, and they never once mentioned how full their ducts and their plenum were of mold, you know, and at the same time they were getting sick. So I find that, you know, giving the power to the homeowners themselves and putting that responsibility on them is very helpful. It's like get an access panel, for your plenum box. So that way you can go in there and regularly check and see if there's mold around those coils. Get a borescope, a snake camera, stick it up inside those ducts and take a look around yourself. You know, yeah. just like you mentioned with a, you know, thermal camera, purchase one, learn how to use it. It's not that hard. It's not that hard. Um, and I will tell you that, um, you know, what I insist upon, and this is the air conditioning company that I use here does this, when they go in and open up an air handler, they take pictures of everything on their phone to document it and they show it to the homeowner. And that's what I tell my patients all the time. So insist on it, you know, for those that are living in Dallas or whatever, if you're gonna find an air conditioning company, they come in and look at your air handler, they take pictures of everything and they have to prove to you that the thing is clean. Good if idea, see, I like that. If you that. see anything growing on it at all, anything on it at all, it needs to be decontaminated. Now, for some of my patients who are really sensitive, that means disassembling the air handler and taking it outside and decontaminating it because otherwise they'll get sick from the smells that are being generated from cleaning it. Um, you know, and they try to use um, biocides and things, but my patients react to those too. So, but, but yeah, you need to insist upon looking at the air handler yourself and making sure that it's been decontaminated. And, and the whole thing about ducts, ducts are complicated. Um, you know, I would love for everybody to replace their ducts, but it's $20,000 to replace your ducts. It's just not practical. So duct cleaning, I find, is very ineffective at any of this. It, it takes off superficial layers of dust, but it's not getting the, these organisms actually growing in the walls of the ducts. You, you cannot clean them. So I think that's kind of a waste of time. What do you think about um, thieves being kind of fogged through the ducts to kill the mold? Have you ever heard it's, of It's fine. We just, we just have no data really to support that. I wish somebody would publish something, but there's nothing. You know, we I, think, I think there was some, I think there was something. I remember hearing a story about. But it was a very small amount of people. It wasn't a really good study. And so we, I would like to believe that thieves would work because I love it. The problem with thieves is it's a very strong scent. And a lot of my patients that are chemically sensitive cannot handle it. Mm. So. And people, some people with mast cell. Elizabeth, isn't that one oil that you react to? No, I can actually handle that oil. Okay. Yeah, but most yeah. of my mast cell patients can't handle that. Um, but yeah. so, so I, go ahead. No, I was going to say, actually, though, when my mast cell at its onset, Emily, you are correct. I could not handle it at the onset. I can now, but, you know, I'm so much further along in my treatment and my ability to handle things. But, yeah, at the onset, I couldn't I couldn't handle that. That is accurate. Yeah. And that's what I find with most people. Um, so, that, so the idea of mast cell activation syndrome and multiple chemical sensitivity, they're intertwined. I mean, they're really yeah. one and the same. And so... Um, yeah, so I actually had two patients this week that I've had to just 
stop their protocol and, and retreat because they're reacting to supplements or reacting to cholesterol, they're reacting to everything. So we're going back now and we're gonna fix their mast cell problem first before we go and try to do all that. Um, but what I found, uh, which is interesting, uh, and I don't know if this has been your experience, Jennifer, but, um, or Elizabeth, sorry. So um, when you fix the SIRS, when you actually get the STRS into stage four, it's, it's in remission, they're doing great, the mast cell goes away. Totally. That's interesting. Totally. I haven't found anybody that continued on with that or chemical sensitivity or anything once we got their service fixed, really fixed. Like they're out of the environment, they've done the detox, they've done the supplements, they've done the Marcons, they've done VIP, they've done whatever it is that we have to do, and they're totally better now, they don't have it anymore. They don't is have that, is that the same so. for those that have like long, long, long-term exposure or, yeah? Yes, hmm. yes. I mean, so, you know, you got to figure my patients have had this for 30, 40, 50 years, right? And no one's, they've been sick forever, their whole life. They get better. You, you just have to do the right things. Richie's Shoemaker's protocol is perfect. It really is perfect. I mean, I've tried to cherry pick it. I, and, and every time I go off of that protocol, I mess up. I'm telling you, it's a perfect protocol. The problem is it's hard to stick to it. And people want to start deviating off into other directions and doing their own thing. No, if you just stick with what he said to do, it actually works. And people get better and they don't have this anymore. Now, I have to teach people how to live with it, right? I mean, this is a genetic problem. It's an ongoing issue of exposure to water damage. And so I have to like teach people how to manage it, but they can have a normal life. Mm. Do you see a frequency of intake after a flood? I know earlier you talked about how a lot of people, right? There's a tipping point. We hear that all the time. You have so many exposures, there's a tipping point. In Florida, do you see that often where the tipping point for many people comes after a flood? Yes. So, so that's what we're gearing up for after Ian now. Um, so I'm anticipating, I just actually crunched these numbers for our three counties down here, Charlotte, Lee, Collier County, that was affected by this, um, we're going to have 20,000 new SERS patients over the next year in the uninsured low-income population. That's 20,000 people that will have no insurance and no way to get help for this, and no one will know what's wrong with them or what to do with them. 20,000 people. That's a lot of people. So that's what I'm trying to gear up for with my free clinic and why we're going to go out into remote locations and try to find these people and partner with United Way and churches and, and try to treat these people on site. The question is, how are we going to afford all the well call we're going to need and all the fish oil we're going to need and all this other stuff that we're going to need? I don't know. I haven't found the answer to that yet. That's incredible. Um, 20,000 people. That's just the low income uninsured people. If you look at in total, then it would be 100,000 people that are going to have a new case of SIRS because of Hurricane Ian just in our three counties. Now, that doesn't include Central Florida, where they had flooding also around Orlando and Kissimmee. That doesn't even include them. I'm just looking at our three counties here. That's 100,000 people. How many of those people are going to be recognized by their medical providers as having SIRS and are going to be treated appropriately? Zero. Do you think that most of these people aren't going to be recognized by their doctors because the doctors just don't want to acknowledge it or because they haven't been trained? Both. Recognized. Okay. I have a question for you. Because You know thought... why? Because, and I've been part of this system. I've been part of the system. If you're part of a normal medical practice that's on an insurance-based system, your goal is to see a patient every 10 minutes. Yeah. That's what you got to do. You can't make ends meet without doing that. And so the insurance system has driven this kind of approach and doctors are a slave to it. And how can you possibly talk to people about their environment, their diet, whatever, in 10 minutes. It's not going to happen, right? So the only thing you can do is give people a pill. Well, there is no pill for this. Yeah. The pill that they give them 
is fluconazole, an antifungal drug, which is going to poison and destroy their brains. So if anything you tell people on this podcast, don't ever take an antifungal drug. Never, never take an antifungal drug for this. We have clear evidence that's published that it destroys your brain. And for, for, for the parents that are listening, because um, unfortunately mold doesn't affect everybody in the household all at once or all the same way. And a lot of times, you know, the younger children, you um, parents just think that, well, maybe it's just they're having behavioral issues or they're, they're just being a kid or they're going through teething or maybe this is just how they are. What kind of symptoms would you say to look out for if a child is being affected? Like what symptoms generally do those children exhibit when they're being affected by mold? Is it GI issues? Is it, do they express it through having bad behavior or anger issues? Well, I take care of whole families, so I'm used to kind of dealing with this. And, you know, as part of our national group, um, we actually have a subgroup called the Christian Serves Network, which is kind of cool. We just set that up and we have a website now. Um, but I have two pediatricians that are part of that. And so they see this stuff all the time. And so their lesson is, if a mother doesn't think their kid is acting right, go with that. Because you guys know. It's, a, it's as easy as that. Yes, they have GI problems. They have behavioral problems. They have strange neurological dysfunctions, tics and various things. Um, yeah, they'll have all of that. A lot of times they're misinterpreted and think that, you know, the school system thinks they're lazy um, and they don't want to go to school because, oh, I don't feel good today. Well, listen to that. Maybe there's a reason why they're not feeling good today and don't want to go to school because their energy level stinks. Um, they don't want to participate in sports. They don't want to run around. I mean, there are telltale signs that a child is starting to break through and have SIR symptoms. And you should have, you know, a low threshold for looking at that, especially if anybody else in the family has ever dealt with anything like this. Like, it's amazing to me, like I saw a new patient yesterday and I'm like, all right, so she's got every, every single symptom on the SIRS list, all 37 of them. She had 35 of them. Okay. And I'm like, and she's miserable and she's been to everybody and nobody's helped her. I said, is anybody else in your family have something like this? Well, my sister has the same thing. Okay. Huh. And how's your mom? Well, my mom has a lot of issues too that she's been ignoring for years. Now, they all grew up in the same moldy home, right? So it only makes sense that somebody's gonna have this elsewise, right? Well, I do have an aunt that has some autoimmune disease. And then I have another aunt and she's got fibromyalgia, which by the way, I have never found a fibromyalgia patient who didn't have SIRS. I've treated over a thousand of them because that's my life. I haven't found one yet that doesn't have SIRS. So you can kind of tell from the family history that there's something not right going on here. Well, when you see a kid in that family not acting right, you gotta listen. Do you also think that possibly the reason why we're seeing more SIRS um, patients is because we're giving birth to sicker generations? We have poisoned this planet. It's not just the biotoxins, it's the pesticides, it's the plastics, mm -hmm. it's the glyphosate, it's the heavy metals. I mean, you, you just throw into this toxic soup all these various things and, and we don't think that they're affecting people. Come on, let's be real, right? Your detox pathways can only handle so much. I mean, God gave us this incredible liver, incredible detox pathways. We can get rid of a lot of things. But what about forever chemicals like PFASs? We can't get rid of that. So these are called persistent organic pollutants, POPs. They don't go away. We have no way to get them out of us, unfortunately, especially the plastics. So no, all of these things have made our immune systems more susceptible now to these environmental exposures. We recently interviewed um, Leah Segetti, and she's really big on PFAS. 
and she said something incredibly incredibly similar and that is her war path right now and it is insane to hear how it is so holistically impacting every area of a person's life like down to their furniture and how everything every in your environment is somehow impacting your body and putting stress on your body right now it's 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 pretty crazy so when you add into that mess now you're living in an environment full of toxic molds and bacteria it's no wonder that people are falling apart yeah. mm -hmm. well how can people learn more about you because we are excited to post this and we want people to come find your organization learn more about what you guys are doing how can they do that well uh, we have a website uh, called freepainclinic.org uh, where we have a lot of information about our free clinic and like I said it's getting ready to morph into something different um, which I'm excited about I'm sad but I'm excited um, and then I also have my private practice which is fibromyalgiafortmyers.com and I have a ton of information on there and I post blogs and I do all this various stuff um, to try to educate you know people about what we're doing. And then, like I said, we just developed this um, Christian SIRS network, um, which is SIRSnetwork.com, CIRSnetwork.com. And on there are listed um, practitioners around the United States that are part of Shoemaker's group uh, that are solid Christians, so that for people who are interested in not only addressing their physical health, but also their emotional and spiritual health, um, we do all that. We're very holistic. Um, so there's indoor environmental professionals, doctors, uh, nurse edu uh, SERS educators, and pediatricians. And so there's various people on there uh, that people can connect with and get help if they want. Mm, that's incredible. Awesome. Emily, do you have anything else you'd like to ask? No, thank you so much, seriously, for all, all the good information you gave today. Well, I'm thrilled. And, you know, if you want to talk in the future about other topics, um, you know, I'll be glad to do that. Like I said, there's a whole discussion on actinomycetes that we could go on with for an hour uh, about how that's hurting us. And then, um, you know, for air filters, if like I'll leave you with a last thing here. I don't know how much you've talked about air filters before, but um, I think it can cover up a world of evils um, for those people that are kind of stuck in an environment and can't get out of it and like we talked about and so if you can put a really really good air filter in there it can cover up a lot of problems and the one that we're currently recommending and i'll just plug them only because it's really good is um, air oasis which is an eye adapt air um, that that model has done incredible things for my patients and actually they've they've actually done the studies on SERS patients to show that if you go into a room with an eye adapt air your symptoms will get 50 percent better within two hours i mean that's insane and we have you know data to actually support that so that's why we're all kind of recommending eye adapt airs around the country now it does hepa it does charcoal it does ion generation it does a whole bunch of things all in one it's kind of affordable um so uh, that would be the last thing I would leave you with is if you're stuck in your environment, fix the air conditioning, do a decontamination, put an air filter in there. Love it. 